Hello, this is Rebel Heart Rose, and I want to continue with the pen of the opera. I tend to forget for last week, so we'll continue it. Chapter 3 The Mysterious Reason. During this time, the farewell ceremony was taking place. I have already said that this magnificent function was being given. On the occasion of the retirement of M. Debian and M. Poligny, who had determined to die game, as we say nowadays, they had been assisted in the realization of their ideal, though melancholy, programmed by all that counted in the social and artistic world of Paris. All these people met after the performance in the foyer of the ballet where Sorelli waited for the arrival of the retiring managers with a glass of champagne in her hand and a little prepared speech at the tip of her tongue. Behind her, the members of the corpse de ballet young and old, discussed the events of the day in whispers or exchanged discreet signals with their friends, a noisy crowd of whom surrounded the su su super supper tables arranged along the slanted floor. A few of the dancers had already changed into me, ordinary dress, but most of them wore their skirts of gossamer gauze, and all had thought it the right thing to put on a special face for the occasion. All that is, except little James, James whose fifteen summers happy age seemed already to have forgotten the ghost in the death of Joseph Bouquet. She never ceased to laugh and chatter, to hop about and play practical jokes until M. M. D. B. N. and Poligny appeared on the steps of the foyer when she was severely called in order, to order, by the impatient Sorelli. Everybody remarked that the retiring managers looked cheerful as is the Paris way. None will ever be a true Parisian who has not learned to wear a mask of gaiety over his sorrows and one of sadness, boredom, or indifference, over his inward joy. You know that one of your friends is in trouble. Do not try to console him. He will tell you that he is already comforted. But should he have met with good fortune, be careful how you congratulate him. He thinks it's so natural that he is surprised that you should speak of it. In Paris, our lives are one masked ball, and the foyer of the ballet is the last place in which two men so knowing as M. D. B. N. and M. Poligny would have made the mistake of betraying their grief, however genuine it might be and they were already smiling rather too broadly upon Sorelli, who had begun to recite her speech, when an exclamation from that little madcap of a James broke the smile of the manager so brutally that the expression of distress and dismay that lay beneath it became apparent to all. Oh, sorry. 
to all eyes. My allergies. The phantom, the opera ghost. Jimenez yelled those words in a tone of unspeakable terror, and her finger pointed among the crowd of dandies to a face so pallid, so lugubrious, and so ugly, with two such deep black cavities under the straddling eyebrows that the death's head in question immediately scored a huge success. The opera ghost! The opera ghost! Everybody laughed and pushed his neighbor and wanted to offer the opera ghost to drink. But he was gone. He had slipped through the crowd and the others vainly hunted for him. While two old gentlemen tried to calm little Jamez and while little Gurry stood screaming like a peacock, Sorelli was furious. She had not been able to finish her speech. The managers had kissed her, thanked her, and ran run away as fast as Ghost himself. No one was surprised at this, for it was known that they were to go through the same ceremony on the floor above in the foyer of the singers and that finally they were themselves to receive their personal friends for the last time in the great lobby outside the manager's office where a regular supper would be served. Here they found the new managers M. Armand Montarman and M. Furman Richard, whom they hardly knew. Nevertheless, they were lavish in protestations of friendship and received a thousand flattering compliments in reply, so that those of the guests who had feared that they had a rather tedious evening in store for them at once put on brighter faces. The supper was almost gay, and a particularly clever speech of the representative of the government mingling the glories of the past and the successes of the future caused the great cordiality to prevail. The retiring managers had already handed over to their successors the two tiny master keys which opened all the doors, thousands of doors of the opera house, and those little keys, the object of general curiosity, were being passed from hand to hand when the attention of some of the guests was diverted by their discovery at the end of the table. Jimmy of that strange, wan and fantastic face, with the hollow eyes, which had already appeared on the foyer of the ballet, and been greeted by little Jimmy's exclamation, The Auburn Ghost! There sat the ghost, as natural as it could be, except that he neither ate nor drank. Those who began by looking at him, with a smile ended by turning away their heads. <clears throat> For the sight of him had once provoked the most fu fu funereal thoughts. No one repeated the joke of the foyer. No one exclaimed, There's the opera ghost. He himself did not speak a word, and his very neighbors could not have stated at what precise moment he had sat down between them. 
But everyone felt that if the dead did ever come and sat and sit at the table of the living, they could not cut a more ghastly figure. The friends of Furman Richard and Armand Montcharman thought that this lean and skinny guest was an acquaintance of DBN's or Polygny's, while DBN's and Polygny's friends believed that the the cadaverous individual belonged to Furman Richard and Armand Moncharman's party. The result was that no request was made for an explanation. No unpleasant remark, no joke in bad taste, which might have offended this visitor from the tomb. A few of those pre present, who knew the story of the ghost and the description of him, given by the chief scene shifter, they did not know of Joseph Bouquet's death, thought in their own minds that the man at the end of the table might easily have passed for him, and yet, according to the story, the ghost had no nose, and the person in question had. But M. Montcharman declares in his memoirs that the ghost's, ghost's nose was transparent, long, thin, and transparent, are his exact words. I, for my part, well, I add that this might very well apply to a false nose. M. Montcherman might have taken for transparency what was only shininess. Everybody knows that orthopedic, orthopedic science provides beautiful false noses for those who have lost their noses naturally or as the result of an operation. Did the ghost really take a seat at the manager's supper table that night? Uninvited? And can we can we be sure that the figure was that of the opera ghost himself? Who would venture to assert as much? I mentioned the incident not because I wish for a second to make the reader believe or even tried to make him believe that the ghost was capable of such a sublime piece of impudence, but because, after all, the thing is impossible. M. Armand Moncharman, in Chapter 11 of his memoir, says, When I think of this first evening, I cannot separate the secret confided to us by M. M. de Bien and Poligny in their office from the presence at her supper of that ghostly person whom none of us knew. What happened was this. M. M. de Bien and Poligny, sitting at the center of the table, had not seen the man with the death's head. Suddenly, he began to speak. The ballet girls are right, he said. The death of that poor bouquet is perhaps not so natural as people think. See me. Debian and Beligny gave a start. Is bouquet dead? They cried. Yes, replied the man, or the shadow of a man, quietly. He was found this evening, hanging in the third cellar, between a farmhouse and a scene from the Roy de Lahore. The two managers, or rather ex-managers, at once rose and stared strangely at the speaker. They were more excited than they need have been. What is it to say, more excited than anyone need be by the announcement of the suicide of a chief 
scene shifter. They looked at each other. They had both turned whiter than the tablecloth. At last, DBN made a sign to M.M. Richard and Montarman. Polygny muttered a few words of excuse to the guests, and all four went into the manager's office. I leave M. Montarman to complete the story in his memoirs. He says, MMDBN and Polygny seemed to grow more and more excited, and they appeared to have something very difficult to tell us. First, they asked us if we knew the man sitting at the end of the table who had told them of the death of Joseph Bouquet, and when we answered in the negative, they looked still more concerned. They took the master keys from our hands stared at them for a moment and advised us to have new locks made with the greatest secrecy for the rooms, closets, closets and presses that we might wish to have hermetically closed. They said this so funnily that we began to laugh and to ask if there were thieves at the opera. They replied that there was something worse, which was the ghost. We began to laugh again, feeling sure that they were indulging in some joke that was intended to crown our little entertainment. Then, at their request, we began. We became serious, resolving to humor them and to enter into the spirit of the game. They told us that they never would have spoken to us of the ghost if they had not received formal orders from the ghost himself to ask us to be pleasant to him and to grant any request that he might make. However, in their relief at leaving a domain where that tyrannical shade held Sway, they had hesitated until the last moment to tell us this curious story, which our skeptical minds were certainly not prepared to entertain. But the announcement of the death of Joseph Bouquet had served them as a brutal reminder that whenever they had disregarded the ghost wishes, Ghost's wishes, some fantastic or disastrous event had brought them to a sense of their dependence. During these unexpected utterances, utterances made in a tone of the most secret and important confidence, I looked at Richard. Richard, in his student days, had re- acquired a great reputation for practical joking, and he seemed to relish the dish which was being served up to him in his turn. He did not miss a morsel of it, though the seasoning was a little gruesome because of the death of Bouquet. He nodded his head sadly while the other spoke, and his features assumed the air of a man who bitterly regretted having taken over the opera. Now that he knew that there was a ghost mixed up in the business, I could think of nothing better than to give him a servile imitation of this attitude or of despair. However, in spite of all our efforts, we could not, at the finish, help bursting out laughing in the faces of M.M. Dubien and Poligny, who, seeing us pass straight from the gloomy state of mind to one of the most insolent merriment, acted as though they thought that 
We had gone mad. The joke became a little tedious, and Richard asked half seriously and half in jest, But, after all, what does this ghost of yours want? And Beligny went to his desk and returned with a copy of the memorandum book. The memorandum book begins with the well-known word saying that the management of the opera shall give to the performance of the National Academy of Music. The splendor of that becomes the first lyric stage in France. It ends with Clause 98, which says that the privilege can be withdrawn if the manager infringes the conditions stipulated in the memorandum book. This is following by the conditions, which are four in number. The copy produced by M. Poligny, Poligny was written in black ink and exactly similar to that in our possession, except that at the end it contained a paragraph in red ink and in a queer labored handwriting as though it had been produced by dipping the heads of matches into the ink. The writing of a child that has never got beyond the downstrokes and has not learned to join its letters. This paragraph ran word for word as follows. 5. Or if the manager in any month delay or more than a fortnight the payment of the allowance, which he shall make to the opera ghost an allowance of 20,000 francs a month, say 240,000 francs a year. And Poligny pointed with a hesitating finger to this last clause, which we certainly did not expect. Is this all? Does he not want anything else? Asked Richard with the great, cool, greatest coolness. Yes, he does, replied Poligny. And he turned over the pages of the memorandum book until he came to the clause specifying the days on which certain private boxes were to be reserved for the free use of the President of the Republic, the ministers, and so on. At the end of this clause, a line had been added, also in pink, red ink, Box 5, on the Grand Tier, shall in place at the disposal, disposal of the opera, goes for every performance. When we saw this, there was nothing else for us to do but to rise from our chairs, shake our two predecessors warmly by the hand, and congratulate them on thinking of this charming little joke, which proved that the old French sense of humor was never likely to become extinct. Richard added that he now understood why M.M. Dubien and Polygny were retiring from the management of the National Academy of Music. Business was impossible with so unreasonable a ghost. Certainly two... 140,000 francs are not to be picked up for the asking, said M. Beligny, without moving a muscle on his face. And have you considered what the loss over Box 5 meant to us? We did not sell it once, and not only that, but we had to return the subscription. Why, it's awful! We really can't work to keep go keep ghost. We prefer to go away. Yes, echoed him Dibian. We prefer to go away. Let us go. 
and we and he stood up. Richard said, But after all, it seems to me that you were much too kind to the ghost. If I had such a troublesome ghost as that, I would not hesitate to have him arrested. But now how? Where? They cried in chorus. We have never seen him. But when he comes to his box, but when he comes to his box, we have never seen him in his box. Then sell it. Sell the opera ghost's box. Will gentlemen try it? Thereupon, we all four left the office. Richard and I had never laughed so much in our lives. <clears throat> Chapter 4 Box 5 Armand Moncharmin wrote such volumina, volumina, excuse me, voluminous memoirs during the fairly long period of his co-management that we may well ask if he ever found time to attend to the affairs of the opera otherwise than by telling what went on there. M. Montarman did not know a note of music, but he called the Minister of Education and Fine Arts by his name, by his Christian name, had dabbled a little in society, journalism, and enjoyed a considerable private income. Lastly, he was a charming fellow, and showed that he was not lacking in intelligence, for, as soon as he made up his mind to be a sleeping partner in the opera, he selected the best possible active manager and went straight to Furman Richard. Ooh, see me. Furman Richard was a little was a very distinguished composer me, who had published a number of successful pieces of all kinds and who liked near nearly every form of music and every sort of musician. Clearly, therefore, it was the duty of every sort of musician to like M. Furman Richard. The only things to be said against him were that he was rather masterful in his ways and endowed with a very hasty temper. The first few days which the partners spent at the opera were given over to the delight of finding themselves the head of so magnificent an enterprise, and they had forgotten all about that curious, fantastic story of the ghost, when an incident occurred that proved to them that the joke, if joke it were, was not over. M. Furman Richard reached his office that morning at 11 o'clock. His secretary, M. Remy, showed him half a dozen letters, which he had not opened because they were marked private. One of the letters had at once attracted Richard's attention, not only because the envelope was addressed in red ink, but because he seemed to have seen the writing before. He soon remembered that it was the red handwriting in which the memorandum book had been so curiously completed. He recognized the clumsy, childish hand. He opened the letter and read, Dear Mr. Manager, I am sorry to have so troubled you at a time when you must be so very busy renewing important engagements signing fresh ones, and generally displaying your excellent taste. I know what you have done 
for Collada, Sorelli, and Lil Jimez, and for a few others who have admirably qualities of talent or genu genius you have suspected. Of course, when I use these words, I do not mean to apply them to La Colata, who sings like a squirt and who ought never to have been allowed to leave the ambassadors and the Café de Quinn, nor to La Sorelli, who owes her success mainly to the coach builders, nor to little Jemez, who dances like a calf in a field. And I am not speaking of Christine Daya either, though her genius is certain, whereas your jealousy prevents her from creating any important part. When all is said, you are free to conduct your little business as you think best, are you not? All the same, I should like to take advantage of the fact that you have not yet turned Christine Daae out of doors by hearing her this evening in the part of Seabill, as that of Margarita has been forbidden her since her triumph of the other evening. And I will ask you not to dispose of my box today nor on the following days, for I cannot end this letter without telling you how disagreeably surprised I have been once or twice to hear on arriving at the opera that my box had been sold at the box office by your orders. I did not protest. First, because I dislike scandal, and second, because I thought that your predecessors, MMDBN and Poligny, who were always charming to me, had neglected before leaving to mention my little fads to you. I have now received a reply from those gentlemen to my letter asking for an explanation. This reply proves that you know all about my memorandum book, and consequently that you are treating me with outrageous contempt. If you wish to live in peace, you must not begin by taking away my private box. Believe me to be, dear Mr. Manager, without prejudice to these little observations, your most humble and obedient servant, Opera Ghost. The letter was accompanied by a cutting from the agony column of the review theatrical, which ran, Oh, gee, there is no excuse for R and M. We told them and left your memorandum book in their hands. Kind regards. M. Furman Richard had hardly finished reading this letter when M. Armand Montarman entered, carrying one exactly similar. They looked at each other and burst out laughing. They are keeping up the joke, said M. Richard. But I don't call it funny. What does it all mean? asked M. Montarman. Do they imagine that, because they have been managers of the opera, we are going to let them have a box for an indefinite period? I am not in the mood to let myself be laughed at long, said Furman Richard. It's harmless enough, observed Armin Montarman. What is it they really want? A box for tonight? M. Furman Richard told his secretary to send box five on the Grand Tier to M. M. Debian and Poligny if it was not sold. It was not. It was sent off to them. Debian lived in the corner of the Rue Scrub and the Boulevard des Copusings Polygny in the Rue Arbor O oh, Ghost 
Ghost's two letters have been posted at the Boulevard des Capucines post office, as Montarmin remarked after examining the envelopes. You see, said Richard. They shrugged their shoulders and regretted that two men of that age should amuse themselves with such childish tricks. They might have been civil for all that, said Montarmin. Did you notice how they treat us with regard to Collada, Sorelli, and little Jemez? Why, my dear fellow, these two are mad with jealousy. To think that they went to the expense of an advertisement in the review theatrical. Have they nothing better to do? By the way, said Moncharmin, they seem to be greatly interested in that little Christine Daye. You know as well as I do that she has the reputation of being quite good, said Richard. Reputations are easily obtained, required Moncharmin. Haven't I a reputation for knowing all about music? And I don't know one key from another. Don't be afraid. You never had that reputation, Richard declared. Thereupon, he ordered the artist to be shown in who, for the last two hours, had been walking up and down outside the door behind which fame and fortune or dismissal awaited them. The whole day was spent in discussing negotiating, signing or canceling contracts, and the two overworked managers went to bed early without so much as casting a glance at Box 5 to see whether D MDBN and M. Poligny were enjoying the performance. Next morning, the managers received a card of thanks from the ghost. Dear Mr. Manager, Thanks, charming, charming evening. Daye exquisite. Courses want making, want waking up. Collada a splendid commonplace instrument. We'll write you soon for the 240,000 francs or 233,424 francs 70 C to be correct. MMDBN and Polygny have sent me the 6,575 francs 30C representing the first 10 days of my allowance for the current year. Their privileges finished on the evening of the 10th, 10th inst. Kind of regards. On the other hand, there was a letter from MMDBN and Beligny. Gentlemen, we are much obliged for your kind thought of us, but you will easily understand that the prospect of again hearing Faust, pleasant though it is to ex-managers of the opera, cannot make us forget that we have no right to occupy Box 5 for the Grand Tier which is the exclusive property of him of whom we spoke to you when we went through the memorandum book with you for the last time. See Clause 98, final paragraph, except gentlemen, etc. Oh, those fellows are beginning to annoy me, shouted Furman Richards, snatching up the letter. And that evening, Box 5 was sold. The next morning, M. and Richard and Moncharmin, on reaching their office, found an inspector's report relating to an incident that had happened the night before in Box 5. I give the essential part of the report. I was obliged to call in a municipal guard twice this evening to clear Box 5 on the Grand Tier. Once at the beginning and once in the middle of the second act. The occupants who arrived as the curtain rose on the second act created a regular scandal 
by their laughter and their ridiculous observations, there was cries of hush all around them, and the whole house was beginning to protest when the box keeper came to fex fetch me. I entered the box and said what I thought necessary. The people did not seem to me to be in their right mind, and they made stupid remarks. I said that if the noise was repeated, I should be compelled to clear the box. The moment I left, I heard the laughing again, with fresh protest from the house. I returned with a municipal guard who turned them out. They protested, still laughing, staying, saying they would not go unless they had their money back. At last, they became quiet. I allowed them to enter the box again. The laughter at once recommenced, and this time I had them turned out definitely. Send for the inspector, said Richard to his secretary, who had already read the report and marked it with a blue pencil. M. Remy, the secretary, had foreseen the order and called the inspector at once. Tell us what happened, said Richard bluntly. The inspector began to splutter and referred to the report. Well, but what, but what were those people laughing at? Asked Montcharmin. They must have been dining, sir, and seem more inclined to lark about than to listen to good music. The moment they entered the box, they came out again and called the box keeper who asked them what they wanted. They said, look, in the box there's no one there, is there? No, said the woman. Well, they said, said they. When we went in, we heard a voice saying that the box was taken. M. Montchairman could not help smiling as he looked at M. Richard. But M. Richard did not smile. He himself had done too much in that way in his time not to recognize in the inspector's story. All the marks of one of those practical jokes, which begin by amusing and end by enraging the victims. And the inspector, to curry favor with Ma M. Montarman, who was smiling, thought it best to give a smile too. A most unfortunate smile, M. Richard glared at his subordinate, who thenceforth made his business to display a face of utter consternation. However, when the people arrived, roared Richard, there was no one in the box, was there? Not a soul, sir, not a soul, nor in the box on the right, nor in the box on the left. Not a soul, sir, I swear. The box keeper told it me often enough which proves that it was all a joke. Oh, you agree, do you? Said Richard, you agree, it's a joke. And you think it funny, no doubt? I think it in a very bad taste, sir. And what did the box keeper say? Oh, she just said that it was the opera ghost. That's all she said. And the inspector grinned. But he soon found out that he had made a mistake in granting, for the words had no sooner left his mouth than M. Richard, from gloomy, became curious. Send for the box keeper, he shouted. Send for her, this minute, this minute, and bring her into me here, and turn all those people out. The inspector tried to protest, but Richard closed his mouth with an angry order to hold his tongue. Then, when the wretched man's lips 
seemed shut forever. The manager commanded him to open them once more. Who is this opera ghost? He snarled. But the inspector was by this time incapable of speaking a word. He managed to convey by a despairing gesture that he knew nothing about it, or rather that he did not wish to know. However, you ever seen him? Have you seen the opera ghost? The inspector, by means of a vigorous shake of the head, denied ever having seen the ghost in question. Very well, said M. Richard coldly. The inspector's eyes started out of his head, as though to ask why the manager had uttered that omnibus very well. Because I'm going to settle the account of anyone who has not seen him, explained the manager. As he seems to be everywhere, I can't have people telling me that they see him nowhere. I like people to work for me when I employ them. Having this, having said this, M. Richard paid no attention to the inspector and discussed various matters of business with his acting manager, who had entered the room. Meanwhile, the inspector thought he could go away, go and was gently, oh so gently, settling toward the door. When M. Richard nailed the man to the floor with a thundering, Stay where you are. M. Ramy had sent for the box keeper to the Rue de Provence, close to the opera, where she was engaged as a portress. She soon made her appearance. What's your name? Mame Geary, you know me well enough, sir. I'm the mother of Lil Geary, Lil Meg. What? And this was said in so rough and solemn a tone that, for a moment, M. Richard was impressed. He looked at Mame Geary in her faded shawl, her worn shoes, her old taffeta dress, and dingy bonnet. It was quite evident from the manager's attitude that he either did not know or could not remember having met Mame Gary, nor even little Gary, nor even little Meg. But Mame Gary, Gary's pride, was so great that the celebrated box keeper imaging imagined that everybody knew her. Never heard of her, the manager declared. But that's no reason, named Gary, why I shouldn't ask you what happened last night to make you and the inspector call in a municipal guard. I was just wanting to see you, sir, and talk to you about it, so that you might mightn't have the same unpleasantness as M. Debian and M. Poligny, they wouldn't listen to me either at first. I'm not asking you about all that. I'm asking what happened last night. Mame Geary turned purple with indignation. Never had she been spoken to like that. She rose as though to go, gathering up the folds of her skirt and waving the feathers of her dingy bonnet with dignity, but changing her mind. She sat down again and said in a haughty voice, I'll tell you what happened. The ghost was not annoyed again.
Thereupon, as M. Richard was on the point of bursting out, M. Moncharmin interfered and conducted the interrogatory, whence it appeared that Main Gary thought it quite natural that a voice should be heard to say that a box was taken when there was nobody in the box. She was unable to explain this phenomenon, which was not new to her, except by the intervention of the ghost. Nobody could see the ghost in his box, but everybody could hear him. She had often heard him, and they could believe her, for she always spoke the truth. They could ask M. Dibian and M. Poligny, and anybody who knew her, and also M. Isidore Sack, who had had a leg broken by the ghost. Indeed, said Moncharmin, interrupting her. Did the ghost break poor Isidore Sack's leg? Madame Gary opened her eyes with astonishment at such ignorance. However, she consented to enlighten those two poor innocents. The thing had happened in M. Debian and M. Poligny's time. Also in Box 5 and also during a performance of Faust. Mame Gary coughed, cleared her throat. It sounded as though she was preparing to sing the whole of Gunnod's score and began, It was like this, sire, sir. That night in Manera and his lady, the jeweler, the jewelers in the Rue Mogador were sitting in the front of the box with their great friend M. Isidore Sack sitting behind Mimi Manira. Mephistopheles was singing Mame Gary were here burst into song herself Katerina while you play at sleeping and then M. Manira heard a voice and his right ear, his wife was on his left, saying, Ha ha, Julie's not playing at sleeping. His wife happened to be called Julie. So in Manera turns to the right to see who was talking to him. Like that. Nobody there. He rubs his ear and asks himself if he's dreaming. Then Amphistophilus went on with a serenade. But perhaps I'm boring you, gentlemen. No, no, go on. You are too good, gentlemen, with a smirk. Well then, Mistif Mephistopheles went on with his serenade. Mame Gary burst into song again. Saint, unclose thy portals holy and accord the bliss to a mortal be bending lowly of a pardoned kiss. And then M. Manira again hears the voice in his right ear saying, This time, ha ha, Julie wouldn't mind according a kiss to Isidore. Then he turns around again, but this time to the left. And what do you think he sees? Is the door who had taken his lady's hand and was covering it with kisses through the little round place in the glove, like this gentleman, rapturously kissing the bit of palm left bare in the middle of her hand, thread gloves. Then they had a lively time between them. Bang! Bang! In Manera, who was big and strong, like you and Richard, gave two blows to M. Isidore's sack, who was small and weak like M. Moncharmin. Saving his presence, there was a great uproar. People in the house shouted, That will do! Stop them! He'll kill him! Then, at, the, at last... M. Isidore Sack managed to run away. 
Then the ghost had not broken his leg? Asked M. Montcharman, a little vexed for his that his figure had made so little impression on Mame Gray Gary. He did break it for him, sir, replied Mame Gary haughtily. He broke it for him on the ground staircase, which he ran down too fast, sir, and it will be too long before the poor gentleman will be able to go up it again. Did the ghost tell you what he said in M. Monera's right ear? Asked M. Moncharman with a gravity which he thought exceedingly humorous. No, sir, it was M. Monera himself. So, but you have spoken to the ghost, my good lady. As I'm speaking to you now, my good sir. Mame Geary replied, And when the ghost speaks to you, what does he say? Well, he tells me to bring him a footstool. This time Richard burst out laughing, as did Moncharman and Remy, the secretary, only the inspector warned by experience was careful not to laugh. While Main Geary ventured to adopt an attitude that was positively threatening, instead of laughing, she cried indignantly, you do better to do as M. Poligny did, who found out for himself. Found out about what? asked Moncharman, who had never been so much amused in his life. About the ghost, of course. Look here. She suddenly calmed herself, feeling that this was a sol solemn, solemn, solemn moment in her life. Look here, she repeated. They were playing La Juvie. M. Beligny thought he would watch the performance from the ghost's box. Well, when Leopold cries, let us fly. You know, and Elizur stops them and says, Whether go ye? Well, in Poligny, I was watching him from the back of the next box, which was empty. In Poligny got up and walked out quite stiffly, like a statue, and before I had time to ask him, Whether go ye? Like Elizur, he was down the staircase but without breaking his leg. Still, that doesn't let us know how the opera ghost came to ask you for a footstool, insisted M. Moncharman. Well, from that evening, no one tried to take the ghost private box from him. The manager gave orders that he was to have it at each performance, and whenever he came, he asked me for a footstool. Tut, tut, the ghost asking for a footstool. Then this ghost of yours is a woman? No, the ghost is a man. How do you know? He has a man's voice. Oh, such a lovely man's voice. This is what happens when he comes to the opera. It's usually in the middle of the first act. He gives three little taps on the door of the box five. The first time... I heard those three taps when I knew there was no one in the box. You can think how puzzled I was. I opened the door, listened, looked, nobody. And then I heard a voice say, Ma'am, Jules, my poor husband's name was Jules and Footstool, please. Saving your presence, gentlemen, it made me feel all overish like. But the voice went on, Don't be afraid, Mame Jules. I'm the opera ghost. And the voice was so soft and kind that I hardly felt frightened. The voice was sitting in the corner chair, 
on the right in the front row. Was there anyone in the box on the right of box five? Asked Moncharmin. No. Box seven and box three. The one on the left were both empty. The curtain had only just gone up. And what did you do? Well, I brought the footstool, of course. It wasn't for him he wanted it, but for his lady. But I never heard her now, nor saw her. Eh, what? So now the ghost is married? The eyes of the two managers traveled from Mame Gary to the inspector, who, standing behind the box keeper, was waving his arms to attract their attention. He tapped his forehead with a distressful forefinger to con convey his opinion that the widow Jules Gary was most certainly mad. The piece of pantomime, which confirmed M. Richard in his determination to get rid of an inspector who kept a, lunat a lunatic in the service. Meanwhile, the worthy lady, lady went on about her ghost, now panting, painting his generosity. At the end of the performance, he always gives me two francs, sometimes five, sometimes even ten. When he has been many days without coming, only since people have begun to annoy him again, he gives me nothing at all. Excuse me, my good woman, said Moncharmin, while Mame Gary tossed the feathers in her dingy hat at this persistent familiarity. Excuse me, how does the ghost manage to give you your two francs? Why, he leaves them on the little shelf in the box, of course. I find them with the program, which I always give him. Some evenings I find flowers in the box, a rose that must have dropped from his lady's bod bodice, for he brings a lady with him sometimes. One day they left a fan behind them. Oh, the ghost left a fan, did he? And what did you do with it? Well, I brought it back to the box next night. Here, the inspector's voice was raised. You've broken the rules. I shall have to find you, Mam Gary. Hold your tongue, you fool, muttered M. Furman Richard. You brought back the fan, and then... Well, then they took it away from them, sir. It was not there at the end of the performance. And in its place, they left me a box of English sweets, which I'm very fond of. That's one of the ghost's pretty thoughts. That will do, Mame Gary. You can go. When Ga Ma Mame Gary had bowed herself out with the dignity that never deserted her, the manager told the inspector that they had decided to dismiss that with that old mad woman's services. And when he had gone in his turn, they instructed the acting manager to make up the inspector's accounts. Left alone, the managers told each other of the idea which they both had in mind, which was that they should look into that little matter of box five themselves. <sighs> okay. We're going to stop there for now. And we'll do five, six, and seven since six is so short for next week. Okay. Ciao for now, peeps. Hope I hope um you enjoyed it.